last day, in which both land and sea rejoice, the day which God hath destined for revelation. That day of God was renewed in the Holy Land a century ago, on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, at the ancient city of Acre, and at Mount Carmel, the holy mountain of Elijah the prophet. Modern Haifa has grown upward and outward. In its midst, the world center of the Baha'i faith, newest religion to call Israel its home. On the mountainside, a beauty spot, whose crown jewel is the shrine of the Baal, the gate to the new revelation. He whose dust was the spirit of Elijah returned to his holy mountain. High on the mountain, a monumental building was soon to rise. It was to be the ark of destiny for all mankind, the seat of the universal house of justice of the Baha'i faith. Singular gardens lay ready as a setting for the new building. Gardens honoring the dust of the esteemed daughter of Baha'u'llah, of his martyred son and of his beloved wife. All about on the waiting mountain were formal gardens, serene, inviting to prayer and meditation. The gardens on the ark, creation of the beloved guardian, are the setting for the International Archives Building. To it go the Baha'is on their pilgrimages. To it went the delegates to the 1973 International Baha'i Convention. At the shrine of the Blessed Bab, they paid homage to the herald of the faith. Climbing the pilgrim path in awe. And entering his shrine for solemn prayer. Their prayers were for the future, for the promises of the Supreme Prophet, for his plan of God. For in this hour, they were to dedicate the site for the seats of the Universal House of Justice. At the top of the ark on the bare mountain slope, there the great building was to stand. Eagerly, expectantly, they awaited the dedication event on that bright sunny day in late April. Charles Walcott, member of the Universal House of Justice, opened the event. Prayers by the hand of the cause Jalal Kaze and others set the tone of joy and expectation. Amatul Baha Ruhir Kanun eloquently spoke on the meaning of the hour. As a bit fitting conclusion, Baha'u'llah's Tablet of Carmel was read by Counselor Betty Ree. Rejoice, for God hath in this day established upon thee his throne, hath made thee the dawning place of his signs and the dayspring of the evidences of his revelation. All was suffused with joy at this prelude to a great labor of love. But soon would arise a beacon from which would stream guidance for mankind. Now the delegates return to the duties of the convention. Full of the warmth of loving fellowship. The Baha'is of the world in the persons of their National Assembly members and councillors, showed themselves to be bright flowers of the human garden, members of the family of man. The design of architect Hossein Amanat was chosen for a building in the classical Corinthian order. In Iran, 
his architectural group set to work on a design harmonious with the shrine and the archive building. From early 1973, our team started work on the immense detail needed for the great edifice. We prepared a simple model showing the relationships of the five buildings of the Baha'i World Administrative Center. With the seat of the Universal House of Justice highest on the mountain, on each side there were to be two buildings. On the east, the International Teaching Center. On the west, the Center for the Study of the Sacred Text. The International Archives, already built, lay opposite to the future International Baha'i Library. Our north elevation shows a simple classical building in harmony with the archives. This section exposes the two wings, east and west, mostly used as functional spaces for offices. The council chamber, the heart of the building, is in an octagonal core, inspired from the geometry of Persian architecture. This core contains three other main spaces, the multi-purpose room, the entrance hall, and rotunda. The detailing of the project was a huge task. For example, the Corinthian capital had to be drawn at full size. Work was very intense for the first three years and lasted until the building was occupied. In 1976, we shipped the initial working drawings to the site office in Haifa. Various details of the construction were discussed with Mr. Aziz Khabihur, who accepted to be the resident engineer. Hundreds of drawings had to be prepared for the guidance of the engineers and contractors. For this unique building, completely new to our time. It was now the time of the engineer, when concepts and plans soon were to become concrete and steel, marble and granite, fittings and furnishings. In June 1975, cutting into Mount Carmel began. The excavation aided by noisy metal monsters. Caves were encountered in the limestone, into which great volumes of concrete were poured, with grouting of the fissures. The soft Carmel limestone was readily pulverized by many metal jaws, until, by December 1976, a platform and terraces were shaped for the giant building. At bedrock level, trenches and footings were hacked from the stone. The first pillars and walls soon sprouted from the rock floor. bedrock beginning in February 1977. Thus began two years of ceaseless pouring of cubic yards of concrete by pump and bucket, each floor or wall heavily reinforced with steel bars. The outer walls and inner pillars began to rise. First, shaping the lower basement on its eastern face. Above the lower basement, the upper basement took shape, its foundation floor extending to the western edge of the building. The northern wall began to rise, 
figure seen against the mountainside terraces. The massive slab of the ground floor took shape, a slab which would become the grand concourse. The great stairs of the concourse were poured, then the side stairs leading to the first floor, which was already framed and concreted. The first floor was marked by the council chamber base with its waffle slab of white etong blocks. Massive sheets of concrete were poured for the office spaces later to be occupied by members of the House of Justice and soon the second floor was completed. With the pouring of the third floor for the secretariat offices and for the rotunda room of the research department, the structural skeleton was essentially complete, requiring only roof and dome. Delegates to the 1978 International Convention celebrated a special event, the further dedication of the building. Old friends were everywhere in the great family of Baha'is gathered that Reswan to witness a landmark occasion. Chairman for the auspicious event was the hand of the cause, Hugo Giacchieri, with Amatul Baha Ruhir Khanum as the principal speaker the ceremony was officially opened by Dr. Giacchieri. And there was a prayer in Persian, then a prayer in English, and a prayer in Portuguese. Following an introduction by Dr. Giacchieri, in which he pointed out the uniqueness of the event all were witnessing, he invited to the table Miss Ethel Revell, former member of the International Baha'i Council. Ruhia Khanum pointed to the House of Justice as a wellspring of peace for the planet. Now, from this building will emanate the laws of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. From this source will come the justice that Baha'u'llah speaks of in his writings. A precious casket contained dust from both holy shrines. Climbing the temporary steps of scaffolding, Ruhir Khanum was followed by architect Hussein Amanat carrying the casket. And by resident engineer Aziz Khabipur. The solemn act of placing the dust in the niche prepared for it and fixing the seal in place with mortar brought a new measure of sanctity to the council chamber within. In closing, Dr. Giacchieri called architect Amanat to pay tribute to his devotion, skill and great labor and to what he must yet accomplish. There were closing prayers, concluding the event. Ruhi Khanum, escorted by the hand of the cause, Abu Kazem Faizi, departed, freeing the delegates joyously to explore the unfinished interior and happily to continue that lifelong love affair among the highs which bursts forth on such momentous occasions. Great historic buildings of Athens were constructed of marble for its beauty and durability. The regal Parthenon of Phidias, grand model of classical Greek architecture, is a heritage of all peoples. Its fluted Doric columns of Pentelicon marble 
have retained their beauty for 25 centuries. The long life of the Athenian temples suggested that Greek marble should be chosen for a 20th century classical building designed to last hundreds of years. Mount Pentelicon lies close to Athens to the north. Its enormous quarries have long supplied white marble for the aesthetic needs of builders in the Western world. For the new building, the quarrymen cut great blocks of marble from the mountain. The blocks were rough hewn to fit the specifications for shafts, bases, capitals, and flat pieces. The work required a special skill and pride too in working with the same marble used by the great Greek sculptors of the past. Block by block, the raw pieces were cut from Mount Pentelicon to be sent by sea to the mountain town of Chiampo in Italy, home of the finest marble artisans. Home, too, of a renowned company which already under the Guardian had supplied marble for the archives building. Each crude stone piece here, the blocks for the pillars was checked first for its dimensions before it was taken to the shops for carving. The mechanical saws cut the flat plates which became the building's outer garment. Each cutting blade is cooled with streams of water. These carry off marble dust which otherwise would fill the air, a danger for the workers. Inside the great shops, careful craftsmen precisely cut entablature pieces, grinding the great plates with incredible nicety with the aid of newly devised electronic controls. A corner of the cornice is given every loving touch of craftsmanship. Few will see the egg and dart and bead designs of the high corners, but nevertheless, each is lovingly crafted. The different rosette designs, all of rare beauty, each require high skill of hand, but a loving heart for the work. Pillars are cut in the yard. Each block of marble is mechanically turned against a fixed saw blade. A beautiful white cylinder emerges from the rough stone under the vigilant eyes of the workers. Each segment of the shaft is precisely ground, for each piece must have the correct diameter to fit its two partners of a tall column. The pillar is turned to cut the fluting with a burr grinder, thus producing the ancient form of a grooved tree trunk become stone. Great cubes of marble were assigned a special destiny to become the Corinthian capitals of the columns. Sent to the cutting table, the first action is to hack away the excess marble at the corners of each block. Then, ingenious, computer-controlled, high-speed circular saws shape each capital, mechanically forming its main volumes and contours. The speeding disc saw is cooled with the water, which also washes away the marble dust. Thereafter, the craftsman cleans away the excess stone with a power chisel. With hands as sure as his ancient forebears, mechanization even aiding his handicraft. In the shop, the capitals are lovingly sculptured one by one.
the acanthus leaves begin to emerge. The modern craftsman in marble handles power tools with that master's touch which carvers of ancient Roman times and of the Renaissance once achieved with hammer and chisel. Now carving a leaf of the middle row. Now carving the leaflets of the frond itself, carefully revealing the symmetry and beauty within the marble. Rib and vein, the leaf form emerges gracefully from the stone. At the capital's top, a flowing scroll is fashioned and ground to a shining surface to become a thing of beauty of the century. To the yard then for inspection, to assure that every piece is perfect, that every pillar section is cut to precise dimension. that every capital is a flawless piece of art in marble. Until finally, most careful packing of the great stone jewels, soon to be shipped to the noble building awaiting them in the Holy Land. The massive gray concrete walls required the beauty and grace of a marble covering. French craftsmen came to hang the white marble plates from every surface of the exposed outer walls. Soon a luminous skin was created to reflect the bright sun of the Holy Land. The bases of the columns were the first to be placed. Each plinth set on the concrete platform, there to await the free shaft pieces. The first shaft segment is carefully swung upward to its base. Then the middle segment is guided to its seat. A third segment caps each completed shaft, now awaiting the capitals. The Corinthian capitals are the crown of the colonnade. Extreme care must be exercised in lifting each heavy capital to its high permanent home. and precision marks the alignment of each capital by the French crew. Ultimately, the array of columns of the colonnade frames the building. The great front stairs are framed by the carpenters for casting in concrete. marble steps are precisely placed by the French craftsmen. The massive concrete lateral arms of the stairs welcome the magnificent marble blocks which are their cover. of the heavy roof slabs is completed on the west and the east. With the roof completed, drum and cornice cast, wooden framing began for the concrete cap of the dome. As before, 
strong reinforcing steel was embedded in the concrete pouring for the shell. All cement surfaces were painted with bitumen as waterproofing. Finally, shining marble was laid upon the dome up to the completion of the marble ring for the capstone. With the capstone rim completed, the dome port was ready to receive the capstone. heavily coated with waterproofing, received a tar felt blanket as a further protection. A layer of insulation was placed against the sun's heat. Wooden stripping was laid for a roof tile covering and ceramic tiles were placed by skilled teams. After 10 years of planning and construction by Persians, Jews and Arabs, Frenchmen and Italians, Americans, New Zealanders and a legion of others, and through contributions by persons from the whole Baha'i world, great buildings stood ready for its occupants. beautiful building embodied a vision of order for mankind. Its western wing of offices and its eastern wing flank the central core, seen outside at its lowest level as the great stair. The living core is felt in the multi-purpose room, in the central hall of the Grand Concourse, in the council chamber of the House of Justice and in the research department, present home of the writing, from which comes guidance for the new day of God. From its seat on the holy mountain, the house of justice looks to its meridian point, Baji, beyond Akka, and to all compass points of the Baha'i world. With the dawn of each new day on the holy mountain, the living building warmly receives its Baha'i workers. First are the construction staff, the gardeners, the engineers of the power services, those who make the building work and preserve its physical health. Simultaneously, the maintenance staff streams in to see that cleanliness and order are maintained in the building. Most are young people Volunteers from the four corners of the world, joyously giving special and hard service for months or years. In the engine room, air chillers for a hot land whine into action. The furnaces are checked for their use when cold weather comes. A diesel generator awaits any emergency 
while the power mains bring in electricity for every need. All the mechanical services feed into the building through the great corridor under the colonnade. Soon arrives the office staff, flowing into the staff doorway at the lower basement. Each morning, feeling afresh the honor of serving in this hallowed building. Some walk upstairs, passing the bookstore with its exciting displays of Baha'i literature. In the Department of Finance, work begins promptly. The treasurer and his associates are involved with increasingly complex responsibilities for worldwide Baha'i activities, which require well-trained staff of reliable and efficient Baha'is. Next door is the data processing service, much needed by the departments of the World Center. Baha'i computer scientists engineers, analysts, programmers have begun to revolutionize the efficiency and capacities of the staff. Computers will make it possible to manage the heavy administrative demands of the growing Baha'i world community. Once a week, the World Center friends meet in the multi-purpose room for prayers and for... Wonderful news. The Foreign Minister of the Netherlands yesterday addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations on the Baha'i persecutions in Iran. The first time the faith has been mentioned in the General Assembly. And now, the World Center Social Register, news of our comings and goings and our housekeeping affairs. The weekly meeting inspires the staff, bringing the warm spirit of the faith into all their varied services. The grand concourse on the ground floor evokes awe for it is the place of the election of the Universal House of Justice, where hands of the cause, councillors and delegates are seated. In the South Bay, a nest of furniture awaits occasional visitors. The lovely North Bay contains the historic painting of the Most Great Prison by Marion Jack. Looking to the western wing in the banquet room doorway, a Chinese table and tapestry present a simple, elegant decor. Adjacent to the concourse is the banquet hall, where future ceremonial events can be envisioned. Above are great chandeliers, befitting the occasions to come. Overhead in the balcony of the hall, a workaday vital labor goes on, for the World Center Library is there developing its resources for research and services, seeking to acquire every publication having reference to the Baha'i faith. The librarians seek answers to reference questions in the books, pamphlets, clippings, and periodicals in the collections. All these activities are the first steps toward a great library of the future with its own building. The second floor is occupied by the House of Justice members and their aides. Each office of a House of Justice member is modest but adequate. Each window looks north to Bachi, source of spiritual illumination. Each is furnished according to the member's taste, displaying precious books, the bust of a distinguished father, the graceful calligraphy of Mirza Bozorg, Baha'u'llah's father. Each secretary aide of a House of Justice member has special assignments, such as refugee problems and translations from Persian to English. Each secretary aide is excellent, her high skills augmented by long Baha'i experience. Word processing by computer has become a great labor saver for every capable aide several of whom have been National Assembly secretaries. The heart of World Center communication with the Baha'i community is the Secretariat. Here, the pool of workers who turn out hundreds of messages each day, an ever larger number of which are sent by telex. All papers, incoming and outgoing, ultimately are consigned 
to the master reference file, a massive storage and retrieval system which requires detailed work by many people. The workers are painstaking and persistent in their difficult tasks, keeping order amid the flood of letters whose accurate indexing and filing makes rapid retrieval possible. The research department serves the World Center, calling upon the extensive files of copies of the holy writings of the faith. The research staff responds to questions from many sources, but principally from the House of Justice. There is frequent consultation on improving translations and on references from the boundless wealth of the writings. And there is endless indexing and making extracts from the holy texts. The Department of Statistics measures the progress of the faith in many dimensions of its expansion and consolidation, collecting and recording facts from national assemblies and their committees, from letters, from every available source. Data are fed into a computer bank for later retrieval and for analysis by trained statisticians who study the quality of Baha'i growth worldwide. At each day's end, from every department, the staff streams forth from the building, ever aware of the rare opportunity for service which they have been given. When pilgrims arrive from the far corners of the world, and fresh from the spiritual fulfillment of visits to the shrines. They enter the gateway to the heartland of the Baha'i administration. Coming up the northern stairway, or walking the eastern roadway to the great stairs, they approach another high point of their spiritual homecoming. The pilgrims converge at the stairs. Here, at this wondrous spot, passing through the great doorway, they look above to the nerve center of their faith, the council chamber of the Universal House of Justice, and to the greatest name on its lintel. The Grand Concourse is a welcoming, warm presence, pregnant also with spirit and echoing with the election of the House of Justice held in this very spot. For each pilgrim group, the anticipated meeting with the House of Justice is a welcome to their spiritual home. Quietly the pilgrims converse, learning more about each other, fellow members of their family of the world community. Some are distinguished servants of the cause. All are workers in the Baha'i World Society, each awaiting the coming of the House of Justice, the supreme governing body of the faith of Baha'u'llah. In the presence of the Master, the sheltering branch, the spiritual reality of the House of Justice is evoked in its council chamber. Nine members elected from the Baha'i world community consult here, making their weighty decisions. With the beloved guardian's eagle reminding them of his guidance. They confidently consult while relying on the promise of divine assistance. The House of Justice looks always to Baji beyond Akka where lies the dust of Baha'u'llah, supreme messenger of God for this day.